Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with the Tea History Podcast, Part 5 already. So sorry to leave you all hanging like I did, telling you everything you wanted to know about the Tea St. Louis, but we're afraid to ask. And then when we got to the best part, the actual classic of tea, the Cha Jing, I abruptly ended the episode. But wait no more. Let's now open up the classic of tea and see what Lu Yu had to say. For the Cha Jing, there are no shortage of sources all over the place. I used what I thought was a good one. It was entitled, The Classic of Tea, Origins and Rituals, translated and introduced by Francis Ross Carpenter. That came out on Echo Press in 1974. That's the one I recommend. Let's just go through the ten chapters that make up the Cha Jing, and if there are any... Noteworthy quotes from Lu Yu. I'll read uh, from Francis Ross Carpenter's translation of the Classic of Tea. The Confucianist in Lu Yu led him to present the Cha Jing in a very organized, methodical way, using lists and precise steps to explain everything. Lu Yu said, quote, To quench our thirst, we drink boiled water. To expel anxiety or melancholy, we drink wine. To clear our heads, we drink tea. End quote. Chapter 1 gives all the history, horticulture, growing conditions, when to pluck, and how everything affects the tea. Let me quote. In planting and transplanting tea, the same techniques apply as for a melon, but the tea may not be picked until the plant's third year. Tea that grows wild is superior. Garden tea takes second place. Whether grown on sunny slopes or in shady groves, the best leaves are russet. These are superior to the green leaves. Tea from the young tender shoots in a plant's first flush is better than that from the buds. The best leaves are those that are tightly curled. Leaves that are open and unrolled are of second quality. Tea picked on the slopes or in the valleys of a sunless mountainside is not worth the effort. End quote. With respect to some of tea's health benefits, let me quote again. If one is generally moderate but is feeling hot or warm, given to melancholia, suffering from aching of the brain, smarting of the eyes, troubled in the four limbs, or afflicted in the hundred joints, he may take tea four or five times. Its liquor is like the sweetest dew of heaven. End quote. The tea liquid, in the biz, that is, amongst the (coughs) cognoscenti baby, is known as the liquor. In evaluating tea, one looks not only at the taste and smell, but the color of the liquor. After a lifetime of associating the word liquor to distilled spirits, it's hard for me to overcome the other definition of liquor as a liquid produced in a process of some kind. Chapter 2 is all about the tools of the trade. Lu Yu listed the 15 utensils you had to have back in his day. Fifteen tools required to correctly carry out all the tasks involved in the plucking of tea, steaming, molding, and all the steps needed to ensure the tea brick was properly sealed and storage ready. He names a basket, furnace, and cauldron, boiler, pestle, shaper, holder, and so on down the line. If you were looking to make tea, you needed these fifteen things. Regarding the manufacture of tea. Lu Yu says in chapter 3, quote, Tea is picked in the second, third, and fourth moons. Young and tender shoots growing on rich, fertile soil should not be pulled until they look like fern or bracken and are four to five inches long. In any case, the shoots should be picked only while the dew is still cool. Do not pick on the day that has seen rain or when clouds spoil the sky. Pick tea only on a clear day. All there is to making tea is to pick it, steam it, pound it, shape it, dry it, tie it, and seal it. End quote. Hey, enough said. No wonder so many people got into the tea business. Also from Chapter 3, Francis Ross Carpenter's translation, quote, Among would-be connoisseurs, there are those who praise the excellence of a tea by noting its smoothness and commenting upon the gloss jet shades of the liquor. They are the least capable judges. Others will tell you it is good because it is yellow, wrinkled, and has depressions and mounds. They are better judges. But the really superior taster will judge tea in all its characteristics and comment upon both the good and the bad. 
End quote. Chapter 4 concerns the equipage. That's a $64 word, meaning the equipment for a particular purpose, which in this case is the storing, preparation, and serving of tea. Lu Yu listed 24 must-have items in a complete tea set. And the cool thing was, the 24th item was a carry-all case, like those Asprey picnic sets. Lu Yu's all-in-one solution. Chapter 5, Lu Yu elucidates on the fine points of making your own tea. As I said, Lu Yu's expertise in water was legendary. He said about this subject, quote, On the question of what water to use, I would suggest that tea made from mountain streams is best. River water is all right, but well water is quite inferior. Water from the slow-flowing stream, the stone-lined pools, or milk-pure springs is the best of mountain water. Never take tea made from water that falls in cascades, gushes from springs, rushes in a torrent, or that eddies and surges as if nature were rinsing its mouth. Overusage of all such water to make tea will lead to illnesses of the throat. End quote. Not all teas require the same temperature of water to steep the leaves. If you use the same water temperature for some delicate white or green tea as you would for Assam tea, you'll really be doing the tea a disservice. But without a handy thermometer around, how do you measure the water temperature? A standard needed to be established to describe the temperature of the water as it progressed to a full boil. Lu Yu famously put it this way, quote, When the water is boiling, it must look like fish's eyes and give off but a hint of sound. When, at the edges, it chatters like a bubbling spring and looks like pearls, innumerable, strung together, it has reached the second stage. When it leaps like breakers majestic and resounds like a swelling wave, it is at its peak. Any more, and the water will be boiled out and should not be used. End quote. And adding his two cents to what the Arya said, Luyu himself remarked, quote, When tea has a sweet flavor, it may be called jia, if it is less than sweet and of a bitter or strong taste, it is called chuan. If it is bitter or strong when sipped, but sweet when swallowed, it is called cha. Chapter 6 is pretty important. This is where Lu Yu generously offers up some wisdom and advice on drinking tea. He also traces the history of tea since Shennong. In this chapter, Lu Yu lets loose about adding stuff to your tea. If you recall, going back to the earliest days of tea... This had been a common practice, going back to the Ba Shu days and ancient Sichuan. Lu Yu had this to say about that, quote, Sometimes such things as onion, ginger, jujube fruit, orange peel, dogwood berries, or peppermint are boiled along with the tea. Such ingredients may be merely scattered across the top for glossy effect, or they can be boiled together and the froth drawn off. Drinks like this are no more than the swill of gutters and ditches. Alas, it is a common practice to make tea this way. End quote. Chapter 7 concerns the gallery of famous people who drank tea. Lu Yu reaches back into history, all the way to Shennong, of course, and he insisted it all began with him. Following Shennong as worthy imbibers of tea were such luminaries as the Duke of Zhou, Zhou Gong, Lu Yu went back through history and gave reference after reference concerning various greats and near greats from the Zhou, Han, Jin, all the way up to his time. He offers up a slew of vignettes and tea stories from various surviving documents through the ages. This is most likely the information he picked up when he was up in Chang'an, working with uh, Yan Zhenqing on that Imperial Library project. Chapter 8 is just a listing of all the various tea-producing areas all over China at that time, as well as the kinds of tea produced there and its quality ranking. In Chapter 9, Lu Yu gives you all the minutia involved about what tools or utensils can be excluded under certain conditions. He really gets down in the details here and tries to think of everything that might happen to someone in the late 8th century and how to deal with it, you know, as far as making tea was concerned. One thing the tea sage was adamant about is that if optimal conditions exist and there is nothing that is out of order, you had better have all 24 things that he enumerates in chapter 4. In fact, 
Liu Yu simply says, quote, If one of the 24 implements is missing in an aristocratic family living inside the city, then tea cannot be prepared. End quote. Chapter 10, I'll just read the whole thing because it's very short. Here, Lu Yu tells everyone how to take the Cha Jing and redo it onto scrolls that could be hung on the wall of any tea house or scholar's residence for instant reference. As I said, the impetus to produce the Cha Jing were certain powers in the tea business who believed a manual on everything one needed to know about tea would benefit both vendors and customers. So this final chapter was meant as a guide for tea shops about how to properly display the Cha Jing in their fine establishment. The great tea saint said, quote, On white silk of four or six rolls, copy so that it can be hung in sections. Spread the sections out in order in the corner of the room where the seats would be. Arrange them so that the beginnings of tea, the tools of tea, the manufacture of tea, the equipage, the brewing of tea, drinking the tea, notations on tea, tea tea-producing areas, and generalities can be taken in at a glance and retained in memory. End quote. Again, the classic of tea, Origins and Rituals, translated and introduced by Francis Ross Carpenter. In reading Lu Yu's classic of tea, it sounds so matter-of-fact and clinical in English. In the classical Chinese that Lu Yu used... It was delivered in a very poetic and special way. You know, the original text of the Cha Jing, as Lu Yu exactly wrote it, was lost. Surprise, surprise. It resurfaced in the Ming Dynasty during the Hongzhi era as part of a larger compendium of work. The Hongzhi emperor was about eh, midway-ish into the dynasty. So it's uncertain if the Cha Jing we read today is the same exact version of Lu Yu's time in the mid-Tang Dynasty. After the Cha Jing was released for general circulation all over China, the whole practice of the tea ceremony and all the early tea culture was embraced by everyone who could afford to buy their own equipage. It didn't take long for the Cha Jing to make its way to Japan, where it also created uh, quite a sensation. The Emperor of Japan began demanding tribute tea as well, just like the Emperor of China got. The Japanese took the Cha Jing and injected it with their own culture and sensibilities, and in doing so, produced their own unique Japanese tea ceremony that would be taken to new heights after the Song Dynasty. Tea had been adopted by the Zen Buddhist monks early on and was institutionalized within the religion. The rituals they created about tea, meditation, drinking tea before images of Daruma and Sakyamuni, was the seed from which the whole Japanese Chanoyu tea ceremony began. What can we call Lu Yu's legacy? I guess it was the way he used plain but elegant words to tell tea's story. One thing's for certain, he raised the status of tea from a thirst-quenching beverage to something that could be savored as well as enjoyed. Some people maintain that tea is a religion of sorts. If that's so, then Lu Yu would be the highest deity. Lu Yu, the legend yielded many interesting and memorable stories. Let me mention a couple of the uh, more famous ones. It's said that Lu Yu's stepfather, Abbot Jirji of Longkai Monastery, late in life, had given up drinking tea. So upset and disappointed was he when his adopted son Lu Yu ran away a second time from Longkai Temple. Remember, he blew off the life of a monk to try his luck in the circus. Well, Abbot Jirji, after Lu Yu bolted from the monastery gave up this passion in his life and insisted no one could prepare tea like his Lu Yu. He was adamant and true to his word all these years that not unless his son Lu Yu prepared the tea could it be possible for him to ever drink tea again. Well, the Tzong Emperor, upon hearing of this story, decided to have a little fun and one day invited the abbot up to Chang'an. The emperor wanted to test this claim out. He arranged for his most gifted tea expert, a palace court lady, to prepare tea for Abbot Jirji to see if he could accept it. And not that she had any pressure on her or anything, but she did her best and made and served tea to Abbot Jirji. The abbot, not wanting to breach any etiquette, accepted the brew graciously and sipped without comment. Eh, it was nothing special. Then Emperor Dudzong 
told the abbot he had one more master preparing tea in the back room, and he beseeched him to try this particular tea. Behind a screen, away from the abbot, the emperor had arranged for Lu Yu to come to the palace in Chang'an and to secretly prepare tea for his estranged stepfather, Abbot Jurji. Lu Yu did this, and the tea, prepared by this mystery tea master behind the screen, was presented to the abbot. He took one sip, and of course you know what happens. He proclaimed it excellent and worthy, and at that point, Lu Yu was trotted out, and they had a happy reunion right there in the palace, and the emperor was delighted that he could witness such a thing in person and to learn that this legend was all true. Too bad nobody got it on video. The other story is a brief anecdote concerning Lu Yu's amazing ability to judge the purity of water. I've mentioned that water is the mother of tea, and just pouring it out of the tap or drawing it from a well is simply not going to pass muster with the tea snobs and tea experts. Water was special, and Lu Yu knew his water. It's said that once he was enjoying a nice Yangtze River cruise one day near Yangzhou on the boat of a Chinese general. The general told Lu Yu that the water from the nearby Nanling River was absolutely pure, and that he had sent a few soldiers to retrieve some of this water to prepare tea for him. And the general had told them sternly, Make sure you draw the water from the center of the river, where it was sweetest and purest. When they got back, Lu Yu asked for a sampling of the water they had carried back. He tasted this river water that purportedly was drawn from the center of the river. He shook his head and said, This water couldn't have come from the center. Tastes like it came from near the banks of the river, where it was less pure. Lu Yu's host exclaimed, How can this be? He had asked his men purposely to draw the water from the center of the river. He called one of them over to explain. The frightened soldier, when confronted with this accusation, blubbered that this water came from the center of the river. Lu Yu said, This water came from near the river banks at best, and in no way tasted pure enough. Lu Yu had some of the water poured out and tasted from another part of the cistern and proclaimed that this bit of water seemed from the center of the river. Upon hearing that, the soldier finally admitted that he had drawn the water from the center of the Nanling River as instructed, but when he got near the banks of the river, some of the water accidentally had spilled out. So to avoid getting into any trouble, he topped off the water cistern with water from near the riverbanks. See, no fooling Lu Yu. He knew. So the Tang Dynasty, they inherited all the momentum Ti had made in the Nanbei Chao and the Sui. In the short Sui Dynasty, Ti had just started to become a social beverage rather than simply a medicine or health product. By the time of the last Tang emperor in the early 10th century, the practice of drinking tea will have not only permeated the entirety of China, it will have woven itself inexorably into the fabric of daily Chinese life. From the highest court rituals down to the most common, mean family, tea became a common thread joining together everyone in China. Arab traders, regularly making the Middle East Chang'an run, were writing as far back as the mid-9th century that tea was a common beverage in China. If it wasn't already, surely tea was on its way to becoming the national beverage of China. Thanks to the great Li Shermin, the Tang Taizong Emperor, the whole idea of reserving the best of the best for the emperor's own consumption, the tribute tea system began. And thanks to the diplomatic alliance between Tibet and China, tea was brought to that rather inaccessible place. And from this sprouted the whole ancient tea horse road that in turn produced stories and legends known by the mountain peoples of Sichuan and Yunnan. Tea got so big, the government themselves felt obligated to get involved. They too got into the business of managing tea gardens, tribute, and taxes. Later on, the Tang government would essentially nationalize all tea. And from the outset, Buddhists, Confucianists, and Taoists would always be tea's biggest proponents and champions. When Lu Yu came onto the scene, he essentially showed everyone how to grow tea, produce it, prepare it, and drink it. He also preached a 
tea philosophy that at first was embraced by the elites, aristocrats, and educated classes, and then a lot of others joined in as well. And this philosophy called for tea drinking to take on a central role in seeking and enjoying peace of mind and an escape from the demands of everyday life into a world where you could forget all your troubles and live in the moment. And the ambience, the teaware, and utensils all had a great impact on the outcome of the total experience. Regarding the whole debate about yueware versus xingware, you remember we mentioned this from a previous episode. Lu Yu was a yueware guy. He gave several reasons why the beautiful and delicate white xingware from Hebei in the north was an inferior experience compared to the greenish celadon ware from Yuezhou in Zhejiang. Lu Yu spelled it out that in comparing the two, Xing ware was like silver to Yue ware's jade. Xing ware was snow, Yue ware was ice. Xing ware with its whiteness allowed you to see the color of the tea more clearly, but only with Yue ware did the tea have its greenish color. If you visit Tianmen in Hubei today, to honor their hometown hero, there's a Lu Yu Square, Lu Yu Park, Lu Yu Avenue, Lu Yu Garden, and I'm sure there's a Lu Yu Tea House somewhere. All things Lu Yu. And in Hong Kong, of course, there's the Lok Yu Tea House on Stanley Street in Central. This has been a Hong Kong institution going back to 1933. I've been there several times myself. Always upstairs, of course, and... Not in the downstairs part, reserved only for their best guess. Lu Yu warned against drinking cold tea and said it gave one indigestion. From what I read, about 85% of the tea consumed in the USA is iced. What would Lu Yu have to say about that? So let's just put the bookmark in here. Next episode, we're going to pick up in the post Lu Yu world and see how things were after the fall of the Tang, the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, and then the Northern Song Dynasty. We'll take another look at our old friend, Emperor Hui Zong again. He was a big tea drinker and proponent of all that was good about tea. All for next time. For now, this is your humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, signing off again from sunny Southern California. Once again, I invite you to go check out the China History Podcast, considered by many to be one of the best China history shows out there. Take care, everyone, and I hope you'll consider staying with the program and consider coming back next time for another mouth-watering episode of the Tea History Podcast. <laughs>